Shri Guru Vaishnava Guru Parampara Ki Jai Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai Gaur Premanande Good evening Good to be with you all again Welcome So I'm going to speak a little tonight from Bhagavad Gita I was speaking from the four verses in the tenth chapter that are at the highlight of the book, in a sense. And um, at Saragrahi, we got through the first two of those who are on the third one. <clears throat> These verses fall in the tenth chapter, Chap- verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. <clears throat> the um, original Gaudiya commentator or the commentator from our lineage from ancient times, Sri Vishwana Chakuti Thakur has described, uh, selected these verses hmm, out, pointed them out and uh, made a comparison with them to um, what ancient commentators of the Bhagavat, Srimad Bhagavatam, the kind of sequel to the Gita, um, referred to as the four essential verses of the Bhagavatam. So he's come up with four essential verses of the Gita. <clears throat> when I was young and uh, joined Prabhupada's mission early on, just remembering this, um, we were in a um, rented house in Santa Cruz. And... Um, first uh, service I was given, this was, this was a long time ago, was to, uh, along with a, uh, who became a god sister of mine, write um, verses from the Bhagavad Gita on the walls. In those days, it wasn't uncommon to write walls, write things on the walls of rented houses. <laughs> uh, thoughts and, and whatnot. So we were asked to write Gita verses. And um, as it turned out, I was told that the verses I had selected were the Chatur Sloki of the Gita. <laughs> and uh, at that point I hadn't read the Gita yet. So I have some uh, connection, it appears, with the verses. And verse tonight is the first verse also that I, I learned in, in the days when it was... Uh, practice to learn various verses that inspired one and so forth. I took that up at one point and this was the first verse that I I chose to learn. So, um, as I say, in a simple way, I have some connection with these verses and they've been pointed out by Previous acharyas, as I say, Vishwanath Chakrabhi Thakur in particular, and other commentators, of course, followed in his footsteps. Pujapad Bhaktirak Sakshidari Goswami Maharaj, our Shiksha Guru, gave a very um, insightful and deep understanding of these verses. In his Gita translation and commentary, the commentary is somewhat light, although built into the translation of the verses throughout. An extended commentary beyond that is minimal compared to um, a number of other commentators, but he gave a lengthy commentary on these uh, four uh, essential verses. And um, his um, Gita is in, in many ways centered around them, his Gita edition. The Gita is rather um, Upanishadic in nature. Sometimes it's called the Gita Upanishad. Um, the Upanishads are, th- are the latter section of the sacred text of the Eastern Revelation that deals with the self, the nature of self and, and, and the absolute, as opposed to the nature of the world and how to move within it uh, in a progressive and pious way. Um, to move uh, above it, so to speak, and beyond it, to be in it but not of it, and so forth. 
This is the subject, then, as I say, of the later section, the Uttarma Mamsa, the Upanishads. The Gita is very Upanishadic in nature. Uh, Krishna is a, here is a statesman. He's a, well, he's a, he's really a taxi driver, but <laughs> he's a, he's the driver of Arjuna's chariot. But he speaks like the great statesman and the orator, orator, philosopher, I should say. Um, so it's a sobering kind of a text, full of wisdom. But that wisdom forms a foundation for love, a wise kind of love, that the sequel to the book, the Bhagavad, really picks up on and centers on. Mm-hmm. The Bhagavad, Srimad Bhagavatam, centers on the love play of the Absolute, portrayed in the tenth book of twelve books that the, the Bhagavad is made up of. And that tenth book is is um, considerably longer than any of the other books and is really the centerpiece of that. And the centerpiece of that book is, of course, the, the gopis' life, Radhika's life with Krishna. They're the consummation of their relationship in the love circle of, uh, of Rasalila. Hmm. Um, and so... As you might expect, if there are to be four essential verses of the Gita from the Gaudiya perspective, they will not be so much the Upanishadic verses, but the verses that have more of a, of a, a rasic feeling and a love-laden uh, content. I was speaking earlier with uh, my friend Josh, and um, just briefly, and um, I was speaking about our lineage and uh, how we're following in the wake of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's ecstasy, really, and trying to make a, a, an extended lake out of the waterfall of his uh, of the ecstasy that he embodied, that it might be approachable to drink from, to to bathe within, and take advantage of, and understand, and so forth, and. Um, and in the context of speaking about it um, and our humble effort to be part of that, um, uh, we touched on the fact that that his teaching and what he embodies and so forth is hardly to do, in one sense, with the very extraordinary idea, fact, that... Um, or the most profound experience, I would say, that we all have in the world, which is that we experience. Mm -hmm. This is very extraordinary. Mm -hmm. In other words, the the natural world that we're preoccupied with doesn't experience. Things don't experience. But we experience things, consciousness. Mm -hmm. Experiences and matter is experienced that is extraordinary. The fact that we experience, which we, which comes to the fore, which comes to the, comes to light, in human life, that we are by by nature uh, a cons- constituted of experiential reality. Uh, human life is that point in in the natural world where, in a sense, nature realizes it has a soul. It's us as much as the body has a soul that makes it move, gives it meaning and life, and and um, in this sense makes matter matter, or <laughs> uh, this is what con- what we do as consciousness. So this, this comes to the fore in, in human life. It's a very extraordinary time, if you will, human time to be uh, living in. And as we could go on about this at some length. Indeed, the Gita does. But... This is more the Upanishadic kind of side of it, if you will, differentiating between consciousness and matter. <clears throat> but as far as the nature of consciousness itself, it's poten- besides that it's different from matter, isn't saying a lot about it, per se. It's saying what it's not. And the Gita is full of this. It can't be burned, it can't be withered by the wind, it can't be drowned... It, uh, it's not this and it's not that, neti, 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 the first six chapters are full of this. It's not this, it's not that. That's not to say it's not much. 
<laughs> but it's not like anything of the objective world that we can, in a sense, get a handle on and define by way of comparison. We can compare one thing to another and thereby get some comprehension of it. We can define a thing by comparing it to something. That, uh, uh, But consciousness is not comparable being experiential to anything, anything, any part of the world that is non-experiential, matter. Hmm? So that it's not this and it's not that it is not to say much about it, but it, in one sense, but to say a lot about it in, in, in another sense, it's, it's to say it's not, it's entirely different than, than the natural world. So is it unnatural? No, it's supernatural and it's you nature of, 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 of things, hmm? of matter. Hmm? We, we turn matter on, so to speak, and, uh, and, uh, and give it an apparent life and so forth. So, as I say, we could go on about this. The Gita speaks about it at some length in the first six chapters. We're in the middle of the, the second six chapters where having understood ourselves to be different from matter, to be, to say I'm, we're not this, we're not that, as I say, is, is one sense not to say much about ourselves, but another sense to say a lot about ourselves by way of saying we're not reducible to matter. Hmm? That means that although we will all undergo a biological death, hmm, uh, we won't die. Hmm? Uh, we're not biological. That's one of the big scientific questions. What is the biological makeup of consciousness? And we ask, why the bias in your question? It should be, is there a biological makeup to consciousness? And the answer, of course, is no. There's not. From the Gita, from the ancients and the moderns as well, it would appear. Uh, um, many of them, with a spiritual outlook in the Gita seeks to very get, clarify what is the nature of a spiritual outlook. And this is the very kind of basis of that. that there's a difference between matter and consciousness. There's a sameness too. Hmm. Leave it to Gaudiya Vaishnavism to keep you confused uh, with its oneness and, and difference at once. And uh, Are we dualists? Are we monists? We're dualistic monists. Transrational dualistic monists would be a translation of achintya beta beta. Hmm? Um, everything is Bhagwan, hmm? is God. Hmm? There is the monism. Vadanti tat tat babidas tat vajjyanam advayam. Brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavaniti sabdite. Seen from different perspectives is one thing. Advaigyan tattva. Non-dual consciousness. Hmm? But it's non-dualism. It's a, it is a dualistic non-dualism. That doesn't make any sense in one sense. How can you have a dualistic non-dualism? Hmm? Um, well, we can talk about it in ways that we can get some idea about it. This is my body, and this is not my body, it's my hand. So, a different, from looking at it from a different angle, the hand is different than the body. From another perspective, the hand is nothing but the body. Hmm. A fire, an example sometimes is given, has heat and light. Hmm. You can't have fire without heat and light, but still we can talk about heat and light separately from fire and kind of think about it and so forth. The inconceivability or the transrational nature of this dualistic monism hmm? of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his followers is, is not that it can't be understood that that's what's taking place. There's a duality and a, and, a, and a unity at once. But how it takes place is, the, is inconceivable. And that is achintya. Achintya means achintya by the inconceivable, achintya shakti, by the inconceivable powers of God that transcend our rational uh, limitations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
it becomes possible. Hmm? Uh, and it's good to know that something, uh, that the reality transcends the limits of our, of our, our reasoning. Because hmm? then it can be conclusive, because reasoning is never so. Hmm? Um, and we can settle, so to speak, on the ground of being. And, of course, my point here is, my point here being, that w- that we want to settle for a moment on the ground of being, only that we could get both feet there and begin to dance. So, while the Gita speaks at length in its introductory chapters about the nature of being, that consciousness is not reducible to matter, as we enter the, the middle six chapters, then it speaks about this consciousness that we are, hmm, the individual unit of, its potential to be all that it can be, its potential to love. It is a unit of being, a unit of knowing, and a unit of loving, hmm, but its loving capacity is is limited unto itself as it is. It's It has a, a capacity to experience indeterminate love, hmm, rather than determinant love. In other words, Sukadeva of the Bhagavatam is the prime example. He was experiencing experiencing swasukam, his own swasukam, the the ananda, the atmananda, the ananda of the atma. Hmm? But it's not, when I say it's indeterminate, I mean there's there's nothing, it's not in relation to anything. Hmm? The love of the self is love not in relation to anything. So you think about love, and you think about loving yourself, and you think, well, okay, (laughs) that only goes so far. Uh, Love really plays itself out when we can love another. Hmm? You understand? Hmm? Yeah. You can love yourself, but love is kind of um, valued, I would say, on a scale of reciprocal reciprocation. So if, I, if you love your father, you could love yourself, you could love your father. I mean, you love your father, then there's ex- this exchange that goes between the two of you, right? reciprocal dealings, and you're mixing the whole thing up, and it's it's uh, churning and so forth, and it's you can't do that. Loving to be is one thing, being to love. Uh, existing, Loving to exist is one thing, existing to love is is another thing. So the bhakti idea is to exist to love, not to love to exist. Hmm? Sukadeva was loving to exist, knowing that I am. Hmm? Not I am American, I am Australian, I am a man, I am a woman, but I am. Hmm? Free from any identification with the natural world, to clutter the fact that I am. Because if I am an American, at one point I won't be an American. Hmm? If I'm a man, at one point I won't be a man. I might turn into a woman in the next life, and so on and so forth. So, so to, again, to come to the fact that I am, this is the Upanishadic side. When we come into the middle of six, six, six chapters, the theology of the Gita, bhakti is brought into the picture and with the ingress of bhakti into our lives, then then there's a possibility for loving another. Hmm? In this case, our source, the Godhead. And there's reciprocal dealings, dasyam, sakyam, vatsalyam, madhurya, and so forth. F- flavors, if you will, tastes of loving um, exchange that is so much depicted in the sequel, the Bhagwat, Krishna's relationship with his friends, with the gopis, with his... Um, elders and so on, and cows and so on and so forth. These are all very profound uh, ideas that are depicted there in the narrative and, and in art and, and so forth. Uh, it's depicting, as I say, the potential of the self that knows itself, knows that it exists. The hum ahata is a quality of the self that I that I exist. Hmm? We have to clear that I that that I am from I am an American, I am an Indian, to that I am. Hmm? And Sukadeva was in this condition, self-loving, but when he heard the Bhagavat, hmm, when he came in touch with Bhagwan, with God, hmm, then 
his capacity to love uh, far um, um, w- was far beyond the, c- the capacity of ananda of joy that um, the self holds. The, 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 the ananda of the self is, is small, and the, the example that is very uh, prominent is that for help us to help us appreciate this fact is that despite that we are a unit of loving capacity, a joyful by nature, we're we're finding ourselves to be miserable more often than not by way of identification with matter. So the Maya Shakti has covered us and this is problematic. But with the ingress of bhakti in our life, not only is Maya Shakti dispelled, the illusion dispelled. Hmm? But Bhagwan himself is is covered, hmm? making possible for intimacy between ourselves and Bhagavan in love. This is Krishna. He doesn't know that he's God. Hmm? In the Brajalila, he doesn't know that he's God. And that unknowing of Krishna is the most profound knowing. That is the that is that is what transcends omniscience, as I've said before. Omniscience is generally thought to be the quality of God, but knowing everything is boring. Hmm. What do you do now? <laughs> so you have to play. Hmm. So the play, Leela, comes out of the omniscience. It's, a, it go, it's beyond the omniscience. He plays. And with whom? With his devotees. And there's a knowing in that playing. He knows, I'm the son of Yashoda. I'm the lover of Radha. I'm the friend of Sridham. Hmm. That knowing is more comprehensive knowing than omniscience because that knowing brings more joy, more happiness. What is the value of knowing? The per- perfection of knowing is how to act. All action is informed by, by knowledge. So I must perfect knowing for just the perfect action by which we can become perfectly happy. Hmm. So Krishna's happiest as the as the the, the beloved object of, of Radha in the Vrindavan Leela. This is who he is, hmm? the God it is in the full sense. That unknowing, that Samvit Shakti, it's a knowing, but it's an unknowing. Anyway, so all this comes our way, so to speak, here in the second six chapters of the Gita. Hmm? Bhakti comes into the, the life of the unit of consciousness that's different from matter. And then it, then it has a potential by way of that association. To not only stand, as I say, with two feet on the ground of being fearless, deathless, immortal, hmm? uh, but now to dance on that field. So while the Gita is very Upanishadic and kind of dances around this dancing topic, that the Bhagavatam is centered on rasa, lila, love. Hmm? The four verses that are the essential verses of the Gita, selected as such by our lineage, are the verses that speak most directly about the dancing, hmm? about that loving, not the not the Upanishadic greater um, uh, extent uh, of the text. But this is this, this is thought to be the centerpiece, and it's understood as such if we understand, as I say, the Bhagavat is the sequel to the Gita, hmm? which of course it is. Gita is, is des- described by uh, my Guru Srila Prabhupada as, as the civilization of the intellect, buddhi. Hmm? That, that term comes up here. Um, and the Gita and the Bhagavat, the civilization of the, of the soul itself. Buddhi means that within that uh, among the fourfold constituents of the um, the internal organ of, of the of the yogic um, perspective the the, 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 the the subtle body chitta buddhi uh, manas and hankar these four to get these four working in the right way hmm? serves to dismantle the hunkar 
and put one in a position to take really fully adva- full advantage of what the Gita and ultimately the Bhagavatam affords us, this opportunity to, to dance, so to speak, on the ground of being in love of God. So, anyway, these four verses are the essence of the Gita very much from the Gaudiya perspective. Hmm? And um, thus they center on on love of God, on rasa, and on the on the and on the the, the love of God that is um, showcased in the Bhagavat, in the in the pastoral leelas of Krishna, the intimacy, love and intimacy. Dasya sakya vatsalya madhurya in the Braj leela, where again Krishna doesn't know that he's God; he's forgotten that by the power of love of his devotees. And and they don't know that he's God either. They know but it's a secondary thing. It's like a mother's son becomes wins the election, becomes the president. And so he says, I'd like to call my mother out on the stage also and thank her. And she runs out and says she doesn't say, Mr President She says, Oh Barack <laughs> And he's kind of like, I'm the president here. <laughs> that's just a secondary thing. Yeah, that, that, that's, yes, we know that. But you know, the main thing, <laughs> so something like that. They think, yes, yeah, they, the yogis say that he's God. and uh, you know, we, we, That's something about him. But hmm? He said it himself. What did he say? Mai bhakti ributanam amritta tvaya kalpate. He told the gopis at Kurukshetra and Bhagavad. Ah, people approach me for all kinds of things. They think in the optimum they can get eternal life from me. I give it. It doesn't turn me on. It doesn't interest me. But what you, other people ask me for things. Some people ask me to get away from things. Hmm? Because things come and go. They don't endure. They want an enduring life. Oh, yes, I give that. But what you, how you've approached me, that's very different. I am... You've approached me in that way, and it's forcing me to approach you and and to come under your influence because you only want what I'm what I'm about, hmm? not what I can give, hmm? what I'm preoccupied with. So, this is the rag bhakti. These verses are about this rag 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 bhakti means spontaneous love. It means a kind of love of God where. There's no calculation involved. That he's God, therefore I should love him. He's God, therefore I should love him. I should serve him. Hmm. But without that, can you imagine? It's unautomatic. Without that kind of thinking, it's like when you stub your toe and you just go out, you don't think, toe has been hit. It hurts. I should say something. Ouch. Because you're so identified with it hmm, entirely, with the body. Hmm. Whatever happens to it, it happens to you. So, so identified with the absolute that that there's no there's no difference in a sense. Here comes the, the monism between you and God, a union of, of love and identification, that, but enough difference at the same time for there to be those reciprocal dealings that love is constituted of. Hmm. So. A lengthy introduction to the section. Hmm? And uh, so we come to the third of four verses here. Krishna says, Tesham satata yuktanam bhajatam priti puvakam tadami buddhiyogam tam yena mamupayantite Tesham satata yuktanam In reference to the previous verse. Previous verse describes the activities of the devotees who have understood what was described in the first verse. The first verse of these four is a verse that speaks about sambandha. Hmm? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told that the sacred texts of the Eastern Revelation is divided into three subjects. One is verses and prose about what he calls sambandha, knowledge about how things f- relate to one another. Hmm? I call it a conceptual orientation. Hmm? So what is the relationship between the self and the body? 
the body and God, the self and God, uh, myself to the world, the world and God, myself. And, uh, how uh, it is said in the Upanishad, sarvam kolo idam brahma. Hmm? Everything is Brahman. Sridhar Maharaj said, yes, everything is Brahman. So there are things, <laughs> and there is Brahman, and the things are Brahman, but it's not that there are no things. There's, there's nothing... Uh, so there's a variegatedness, there's a, there's a dualism within the monism, there's a variegatedness, and um, in how those things fit together, in other words, there's Bhagwan and his Shaktis, and how they f- function in relation to one another. This conceptual orientation was spoken about in the first verse where Krishna said, Aham sarvasya prabhavo matasavam bhavartate, I am Swayam Bhagwan. This is the centerpiece of the Sambandha Gyan of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Krishna's two, Bhagavan Swayam. This is the centerpiece of that. Gaudiya Vaishnavism is about, as I said, our, our prospect for loving, hmm? understanding what we are, hmm? what we are not, and then flying as high as we can in the sky of, 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 of loving potential. Hmm? As Dasyam, as Sakyam, Vatsalya, Madhurya, and so forth. Hmm? Um, so in order to, 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 to do that, hmm? to, to love to f- in full measure, to give, in other words, we have to find the taker who has the capacity to take unlimitedly. So this is the central piece of the Sambandha. Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam. He can take completely. Krishna is depicted as a taker, an enjoyer. Uh, some time ago, one of our students said that they had spoken with a Christian, and the Christian said, you know, uh, our idea of God is better than yours. Why is that? The Christian said, because Christ is our idea of, of, of God, and he see the sacrifice that he underwent for humanity. And your idea of God is Krishna, and he's just in, he's an enjoyer. Hmm? and a uh, uh, taker. That's an ugly thing. Hmm? A sacrificer, a giver. Hmm? This is in the spiritual direction. Taking is in the, is in the material direction. So I replied, I said, it's true that Christ is depicted as the giver and a, and a sacrificer, but who's he giving to? <laughs> there has to be a taker. Hmm? And who's actually the taker hmm? is is only apparently so, because who's actually the taker is able to give in a way that no one else can, like the stomach takes in a way that no other part of the body can. Hmm? The roots take, in the metaphor of the tree, in a way that no other part of the body, the, the tree can. And by taking the roots, the stomach in these examples, nourish the entirety of the body. The hand, if it keeps the food, (laughs) uh, it's not going to nourish the whole body, but if it gives to the stomach, the stomach then distributes it in a way. It serves the whole. The the, the whole is nourished by by the... The the circumference is is held by the center. Hmm? Take out the center, it all collapses. So if there's no no, no object to give to, no perfect taker... How can there be any giving to begin with? Hmm? So, no, Krishna is the taker. He's depicted as such. And of course, in the context of taking, he's receiving unlimitedly. He's reciprocating unlimitedly. As they approach me, I reciprocate accordingly. This is his his promise. He has that that capacity. Hmm? So the central piece, in one sense, of the Gaudiya Sambandha conceptual orientation, that a certain type of action will follow. How you are conceptually oriented will just determine how you how you act. So there's, if you're going to act as a lover, hmm, as a giver, which is what bhakti is about, the action, hmm, then part of the conceptual orientation and the central part of it has to be who's the taker, where do I give to? We say that giving is the getting, but we'll only experience that 
when we give to the center, only to the extent, I should say, that we give to the center. We can give off-center and we'll get something. Some, some, there will be some getting in the giving, but when the giving is actually on the, given to the center, then you will understand that the giving is the getting. Two things are required. One thing, you have to know the center. Second thing, then, you have to, you have to give without expectation of return. So you might theoretically want to give unlimitedly, but it may not be so easy hmm, because others are drawing on you. Hmm? Things, attachments, ideas, conceptions, and so forth. Hmm? As they diminish in the context of trying to give to the center, hmm, we, we come gradually to the perfection of, of giving and loving in which, 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 where we realize the universally accepted adage that giving is the receiving. This is what this is Gaudiya Vaishnavism, and if people ask you, "What are you about?" you say, "Giving is receiving," and walk on. <laughs> and then here's a few thousand words about it, a few million words about it, and lectures and <laughs> practices to understand it, and so forth. So what we're talking about here, as complicated, complicated as it may seem at times, especially for those who aren't used to listening to to, to me or to the vocabulary and so forth. We're really speaking about universal concepts. Here's one. Nothing that, nothing that we don't already accept, acknowledge. Giving is the receiving. But what are the implications of that? Play that out. How can the giving actually be the receiving? Because people say, well, I believe that, but I gave, and a lot of times huh, I didn't get much out of it. Hmm? So the problem may be, even though you may have been giving selflessly, are you giving to an object that's capable of receiving? Hmm? If it's an object that's here today and it's gone tomorrow, well, that's problematic. Hmm? Krishna says, I'm, I can take. Bring it to me. Give. I can take it. I can absorb it all, digest it, and send it all back and nourish you in a way that no other can. I am Krishna. I am the center. He says, Aham sarvasya prabhu, mata sarvam He says it like, I'm everything. Everything comes from me. He wants to make sure he got it. Hmm? I'm the source of everything. Everything comes from me. Hmm? Knowing this, one is well equipped, he says, by this conceptual orientation of Sambandagyan, to, in, to, to conduct oneself hmm? in such a way as to know me intimately, hmm? as, to, as to love in the fullest uh, capacity. Um, Knowing this, one is well equipped to enter into a union with me in wise love. Hmm? Having said that, and given the basic sambandha, this is the root kind of key password to the to the to the tattva, the, the, the spiritual conclusions of the Bhagavat hmm? and the Gita, Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam. There's a whole treatise called Krishna's Sandarbha written on this one line by Sri Jiva Goswami. Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam, Krishna Sandarbha. Hmm? Um, he says it's the it's it's the Paribas Sutra. It's the it's that sutra that unlocks the whole uh, the, the treasure of the the key to understanding the Sambhan, it's the password that lets you in, so to speak. Uh, so, having given that brief um, but profound conceptual orientation, then he speaks about the Abhideya. I said there are three topics the scriptures are divided into. Sambanda, Abhideya, Prayojana. Abhideya means that action that the conceptual orientation fosters. If you are thinking like this, then you will act like that. <coughs> hmm? So if you have got this conceptual orientation, Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam, Krishna's, this is the center, then you're going to act in a certain way. That action is called bhakti. Hmm? And it's characterized, matchita matgata prana, bodhayanta parasparam, katayam tascamam nityam tushanti charamam ticha. This is the second verse. Hmm? It's all about rag bhakti. Hmm? Matchita matgata prana, 
It's speaking about shravanam, kirtanam, smaranam. Hmm? Matchita, this is, this is smaranam, matchita, matkata prana. Hmm? What you think, think about, they, th- they think, these people who know this, they think about me, matchita. They're chitta. Hmm? Their, their consciousness is fully absorbed in me. This is smaranam. Hmm? They, this is their samadhi. Hmm? They're trance. They're in a trance about me. Matchita, matgata prana. How do they arrive at this matchita? Madgata prana. Hmm? That their pran, pran means life, the life air, the breath. They breathe for me. Hmm? I am their breath. My, I am their food. Hmm? They li- like you lived. It w- w- when's lunch? When's dinner? What time is breakfast? Hmm? So we live to eat, <laughs> in a sense, because we know that without eating we can't live. Of course, we shouldn't live to eat. We should eat to live, but they're interrelated and so forth, and, and a lot of people are living to eat. So what, 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 when, when do we eat? Uh, so as much as one is preoccupied, the implications with eating, hmm, because it sustains one, he said, Madgatapra, their lives are sustained by me. They breathe, pran, Madgatapra, they breathe, they're, I'm their breath. They're breathing only for me. So their body, hmm, they're, they, we have a physio-psychological composition, materially speaking. The physiological side of it is breathing for me, hmm, living only for me. And so because of that, the psychological side, the chitta, hmm, this internal organ, this subtle body, is absorbed in me. Madchitta, hmm? madgata, prana. Hmm? Bodhayanta, prasparam. And bodhayanta implies hearing. These people, their lives are dedicated to me, their minds are absorbed in me, meditating upon me. Hmm? Bodhayanta, prasparam. They sit with one another and they, bodhayanta, prasparam. They, they hear. They read the book. Hmm? It means bodh. Bodh means buddhi. Hmm? They, in, 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 they, 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 they hear from from revelation from the sacred texts about me and discuss it with one of the katayantas chamam. So they hear shravanam. They ch- katayantas chamam. They do kirtan kata. They speak about me. They chant about me. Shravanam. Kirtanam and Machita Smaranam. Hmm? These are the three main limbs of bhakti relative to rag bhakti. Hmm? Shravanam Kirtanam, Kirtana Prabhavi, Smarana Svabhavi. By the power of Kirtan, this Machita will become absorbed. Hmm? Meditation will come spontaneously, hmm? effortlessly, through Kirtan. Shravanam Kirtanam. So as that starts to happen, hmm? As internal life starts to develop, hmm, much of that and all that, impl- that that implies is fortified uh, by by kirtan, shravanam kirtan, shravanam kirtanam. Katayantaschamam tushanti charamanti cha. In this way, they enter into dasya, sakya, vatsalya, and ramanti cha, and madurja. And here he says tesham sadhvayuktanam. Those people hmm, that I just talked about who have that conceptual orientation that fosters this kind of action that's absorbed in me, hearing, chanting about me, minds absorbed in me, who uh, they attain satisfaction. How do they attain that satisfaction? How do they attain me in Dasya Sakya Bhat? So this verse is about prayojan, hmm? then. This in the next verse. Or the attainment. You have a conceptual orientation that fosters a certain type of action, which in turn will... Um, result, have a particular result. The action will have a result. The result is prem prayojan. Hmm? The result is love of God. The conceptual orientation is you're not the body. Hmm? You're a shakti, a part of, of, of Bhagawan. You're supposed to have a relationship with Bhagawan through, you can through love. And so, and so you act in relation to that hmm? and you get it. Hmm? So here's this, Tesham Satatayuktanam, those devotees I was just talking about, hmm, 
in, 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 of, of the Braj Lila type, Tushanti Charamanti Cha, the Samanda Rupa devotees, Samanda Nuga devotees, the, the, uh, Kama Rupa, Kama Nuga. Hmm? There are exemplars of these uh, uh, loving sentiments, uh, uh, parental love, uh, romantic love, friendly love. There are exemplars of this that are part of the entourage of Krishna. His mother, his father, his lovers, his, his friends, and so forth. The, 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 to follow them, hmm? to follow in the wake of their love, this is rag bhakti. Hmm? Um, Dasya Sakya Vatsalya Madhura Tushanti Charamanti Char This refers to them. <clears throat> in, 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 why? In Vaikuntha, where there is reverential love of Narayan, a form of Krishna with four hands and so forth, he has no father. He has no mother. Hmm? He has no bosom buddies either. Hmm? He has servants. So there's no sakya. There's half of sakya. If a servant becomes knows you for a long time, he picks you up from the airport, your chauffeur, and you say, Joe, what do you think? Should I invest in stocks or treasury bonds? What's your opinion? Well, boss, uh, <laughs> uh, He's a little awed by the fact that the boss asks him, but he offers some advice, friendly, and says, hang on to your money. That's what I'd do if I were you. Something like that. So this servitorship can have a border on friendship. We find this in Vaikuntha, but, but no uh, pranai, no f- love and friendship where the per- your friend is, is, you feel is, he and I are one. Hmm? This we find in, in, in Golok, in the Brajlila, and Mabatsalya, and Madhurya, full expression. So, so, as I say, this previous verse referring to that, he says, about them, Tesham Satatayuktanam, about those people, those devotees I'm speaking of, who are Satatayuktanam, they're always united with me, Bajatam Priti Pubukam. Tesham Satatayuktanam means the bhakti idea, mm-hmm. uh, yoga yuk, yuk ut, utama, mm-hmm. uh, united in the in a yogic sense, they are always united with me. Satatyuktana means they are connected with me in a way that, that that they cannot come out of that. It's not a casual encounter mm-hmm. with no strings attached. No, mm-hmm. it's <laughs> very much bound up. Uh, uh, and it's 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 based on its dominant sentiment for love that commands and uh, defines a person. Stai, stai bhav. It defines the the person in love with Krishna as friend, as lover. It 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 defines them. It it is what they are. Hmm? Um, this is mitesham satatyuktanam. Bajatam priti come. They're always in, in, engaged in love with me. Priti come completely. Hmm? Dadami. Those people, Dadami, I give them something. Dadami buddhi yogam tam. Yenamam upayantiti. I give them the knowledge by which they can come to me. I give them buddhi yogam. Hmm? Now, uh, when we render the verse like this, the common rendering of the verse, we will understand, as the previous verse is speaking about bhava bhakti, hmm? so this verse is also speaking about bhava bhakti, attaining bhava bhakti. Hmm? How does one attain it? Krishna gives it. Hmm? It is a blessing. Hmm? Bhakti is not inherent. It's not, it's not your right. It's a gift. Hmm? Swasukam, you can have a happiness of the Atma, but the happiness of Bhakti, that's, that's grace. That has to be given. Hmm? So, this Buddha Yoga I'm here, he says, I give to them that by which they can, I give Bhava to them. 
to those devotees who are in asakti, attached to me in love, I give them bhava. But buddhi yogis, I give them buddhi yogis. Buddhi yogis mentioned earlier in the Gita, in the second chapter, the 39th verse of the second chapter, Krishna has spoken about sankhya, about the knowledge of the self, differentiating the self from matter. And he says, now I'm going to tell you about buddhi yoga. So buddhi yoga here doesn't mean gyan. He gave gyan in the second chapter. Then he said, now I'm going to tell you something else. It's called buddhi yoga. Buddhi yoga doesn't mean gyan yoga. It means bhakti yoga. It means that, 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 that bhakti yoga is is a wise kind of love. Hmm? Um, and bhakti yoga proper is bhava. Hmm? A, the, the, the ingress of Krishna's internal shakti, surup shakti, into the jiva. I give that to them. Then they, Then in bhava bhakti, they proceed and they come to me because they cultivate that bhava and it turns into prem. Hmm? Um, this is the uh, general idea. Hmm. Pujapat Sridhar as I mentioned, has given a lengthy commentary on these verses. and He makes the point here that from the perspective of those who in one sense this verse is describing, those who have already attained bhava, hmm? They are doing priti puvakam. They're in, they're united with me in love constantly, and so forth. What will be the need to give them anything? How? What kind of knowledge will they need hmm, to come to me? Hmm, they're already with me, so it sounds contradictory. Hmm. So he beautifully um, resolved that by saying that in the brajlila, those gopis who come to Krishna. Hmm, Upayantite means to come to Krishna. They have difficulty, in the context of the Leela, they have some difficulty in coming to him. Because in the context of their Leela, the Leela, their love is 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 unlawful. Hmm? They're meeting with Krishna in the night, and so forth. Hmm? And there are impediments to this. This is called uh, parakiya. Hmm? He played Shri on the word upayanti, upapati, hmm? bhavena. Hmm? Upapati means, pati means like husband. Upapati means like, uh, not your husband, but your lover, which you're not supposed to have. Hmm? Uh, secret and illicit love. Of course, there's no illicit love in love of God. Hmm? But there's an appearance of such for the sake of, of play, drama, hmm? and heightening the intensity. So the gopi's love is not wedded love, which turns really into into friendship anyway, hmm? oh, at least, if not something worse than that, <laughs> and loses it loses its excitement. This is a kind of love in which the magic is never gone, hmm? so to speak, this parakia. So... Uh, Sridhar Maharaj was actually writing his commentary on the Gita when Prabhupada was writing his commentary on the Gita. They are God brothers and they were living, uh, Sridhar Maharaj was living in Prabhupada's house. And so when he was writing about this verse, he said, I've written about this verse and the word upayanti, it means they come, uh, I, they come to me, I show them, I give them knowledge about how they can come to me. I think that upayanti ultimately comes to upapati bhavena, that... Hmm, it has to be speaking about those gopis who are full of love, fully absorbed in love. Their staibhav has fully developed their identity in, in spiritual life. They have brain, but still they have difficulty coming to me in the context of the leela. Nishoda, Krishna's mother, wants me to go to bed at night. That the svatsalya, parental love, is in conflict with romantic love in the leela in a beautiful way. She wants him to sleep at night, and they want him to come out at night. And out he goes, out the window. Hmm? And and so the, he never sleeps. Hmm? This is the idea. Because of Gopi Bhav, he never sleeps. He's very animated in the Brajlila. But the Gopi Bhav in particular, that is keeping him up at night, even. Hmm? So off he goes, and 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 off they go. 
to rendezvous with him in the middle of the night. So there are obstacles. So he gives them the Buddhi yoga. <laughs> he gives them the knowledge how they can come to him by sending signs, by giving a sign to Subal, his close bosom buddy, that nobody can understand except Subal. This is one of the characteristics of this Priyanarma Sakha, the bosom buddy friends of Krishna in Alila. One of the characteristics is they, they, make, they speak in signs and no one can understand, but Krishna understands what they're saying. And they're, giving, they're talking about meet her over here under this tree at this time. That's the rendezvous. Hmm? Spot like this. They're helping make these arrangements and so forth. Nikunjayuno hmm? Helping in this, all these affairs. Hmm? So with that in place in the day, then hmm, taking that map, so to speak, uh, that uh, where to meet uh, and, and following that, he, in this way, he makes arrangements through his friends and others to, for them to meet with him. Hmm. This is one example. He, he gives them the wisdom, tell her to meet me over here hmm, at this time. Okay. And nobody else knows what they're talking about, something like that. So they go, and then their friends go, and they speak with the gopis. This will be the spot. We'll meet here. This way he gives the knowledge hmm, by which they can come to me. And the contradiction is resolved. The contradiction being, how can those that are already loving Krishna must be with him, need knowledge how to come to him? They certainly don't need the knowledge that you're not this body and all this. That's like long, they're way beyond, beyond that now. Hmm. They don't need even even the, the the knowledge that is the that is the love of bhakti bhava. When you love, you know what to do. Kind of, hmm? they've already got that. Still, in the context of the leela, they need some special knowledge. He gives that kind of knowledge. This is again some idea of how the Gaudias have said yeah, these are the most important verses of the Gita because they speak to us about these things, these things that are central to the sequel to the Gita, the Bhagavat itself. Hmm. Any question? Well, it's been recorded. You can listen to it again. <laughs> A lot to be said. Anyway, it's nice to sit with you all again this evening. We'll continue tomorrow um, with the fourth of these verses, and then um, we'll segue in the coming days into some discussion about the Prahlad Narsingha Lila because the appearance of Narsingha, one of the avatars of Krishna, is um, celebrated this coming Thursday, Shinga Chaturasi, the 14th day of the waxing moon, uh, I believe. That's on Thursday. So that's a very huge l- leela of the Bhagavatam, very ins- insightful. We'll see if we can discuss it a little bit for a few days. Okay. Simad Bhagavad Gita ki jai, Sisi Govindatananda ki jai, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki jai, Gaur Premanande.